This is the Between Night Visitors Part 7. I want to do some recapping from last time. As a playgroup, we've had a break of a week, so we might need to do some recapping here. Let's just do a quick condition recap on the hunters because I think that's always helpful. So the beast Hank Nelson has a taste for it and the sons of another world. Green has marked by La Hortensia Fig and always the last to leave. We have a new move related to that as well. Um, Ethan Quinn has must be photographed by, oh, who's WC? What's that? Oh, by the way, the camera and most beloved. And uh, Mr. Talliford has a taste for it and a nose for it. The it in question is human flesh. Let's go ahead and talk about the threats. You currently have two active threats. Um, one of them is Fig's Pigs. You still have two of your three questions to pursue on Fig's Pigs. Uh, the one that will help you capture Patrick and the one that will help you capture La Hortensia or destroy them as the case may be. Um, for Patrick's, it's what kind of animal does Patrick Fig think he is? And that will allow you to lure the animal out in the open and then capture or destroy him. And then finally, what did La Hortensia Fig lose that she's trying to recapture or remember? And um, that will allow you to find her and capture or destroy her. You currently have, um, looks like you have one clue available presently uh, for this, uh, this threat. You did... Uh, answer and resolve one of the um, Q and O's, which was what type of victims Obert Fig prefer. And last time we saw Mr. Nelson have a dramatic showdown with Obert Fig. Let's go to the Waitley camera. Uh, this is the one where we have this actress who has gone missing at the Society Obscura. And Hargrave House has learned that the Society Obscura has in their possession the legendary Waitley camera. Waitley camera, is thought to be um, the vessel or medium by which an extra dimensional being uh, communicates or exerts power into the world. And we have um, the circumstances of the camera are that you can, you, can, you can set up circumstances that will allow the camera to transport the subject of the photograph to another dimension, presumably the dimension where this creature um, exists. Uh, Mr. Waitley, in his initial research, started calling this, um, this realm the fragrant void. So you have eight clues here on a complexity eight, which is what circumstances will cause someone photographed by the camera to disappear. It unlocks two opportunities. The first is you can resolve the threat by reversing the process and bringing Penelope back. The second is that you can use the camera to transport yourself to the fragrant void and make contact with the entity there, which unlocks a custom move, Void Walker. So those are both, uh, you can pursue both and uh, uh, just by doing the one question. You have eight clues right now. You made really good progress on that one actually last time. And so, yeah, that's sort of where things stand there. Some other sort of non-threat related things. We have this ongoing story about Julius and the last night phase Julius interrupted the proceedings at Hargrave House by showing up with Tatiana Brathwaite, the daughter of Theodora Brathwaite, and Tatiana's two friends from America, a pair of twin brothers, aristocratic twin brothers, um, Topper and Taffy. And we had some scenes there, some sort of uh, cat and mouse sort of social interactions. Sounds like Tatiana is organizing a hunt of some sort, and it has been strongly implied that someone from Hargrave House is going to be the quarry in that hunt. Who knows when or if they will make their move there, but in any case, that's a thing. And yeah, that's sort of where things stand right now as far as the story goes. How is everyone feeling? Does anybody have anything they want to offer as a sort of reminder of what happened last time? Uh, the only thing the only thing I'll add is that uh, Mr. Talliford uh, was there to cover for um, for Hank when he transformed a little while ago. Uh, and they've had a couple of morning masses where they've been talking about that and talking. Over yeah, that's that. an that's an interesting ever deepening sort of like 
uh, story between the two of them, which I think is intriguing. You have that connection now. Um, fabulous, okay. So we're in the day phase. And um, we have less than three active threats, so I will introduce a new one. A more lighthearted threat today, since you all have had a lot of gnarly, gruesome threats to deal with lately. This threat is called the Creature of Cremorne Gardens. That ever reliable rag, the Illustrated Police News, has lately been carrying stories about the so-called Creature of Cremorne Gardens, sometimes called the Creature of Chelsea Harbor, which is nearby, and more rarely the Creature of Chain Walk, which is a street that is also nearby. The creature, described as a fish-like thing or a fish man, has been terrorizing pleasure seekers from the shadows, giving a fright when glimpsed skulking about, but rarely making direct contact. Men and women alike have been lured to the end of a nearby pier by a, quote, strange song while promenading, though with no memory of how they got there once the song's spell ended. All of this could easily be chalked up to hysteria or perhaps some elaborate hoax by someone who resents Cremorne Gardens, if not for a physical attack upon a young couple, Simon Piedmont and Beulah Thrum. I will type the names here for now. Mr. Piedmont and Ms. Thrum described how the creature leapt at them from a crouched position like a cat and tore at Ms. Thrum's coat. Scotland Yard is investigating. I have a question. I'm going to pose this to Mr. Talford. Mr. Talford, you have a connection to Thomas Simpson, the proprietor of Cremorne Gardens, having worked there one summer. What was your job and what did you do to lose it? And here I'll tell you that these pleasure gardens in this era, they were essentially like uh, they're like theme parks, basically. You would go there, there would be a hedge maze, there would be like a dancing platform, there would be, um, this particular one has an American bowling saloon and, uh, and a firing range, uh, hot air balloons, it's that kind of place, uh, fortune tellers, that sort of thing, right? And so, Mr. Talliford, what did you do there last summer and how'd you lose your job? So I think I was working in the hedge maze and it was like sort of a haunted hedge maze theme. And um, so I think that there were complaints that it was too extreme. Um, I don't know how detailed you need that, but uh, I think there were some powers involved that made the hedge maze too extreme. Well, too, and I, was, too I was gently let go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Well, you know Thomas Simpson at the very least, and probably other people who work there because of your time there last summer. Um, this is a fairly low stakes threat, if I'm being honest. I don't think this is not the kind of thing the Hargrove House would probably care about too much, except if it is a real fish creature, that would be of interest, I suppose. Um, you do have a question here, though, which is, it's a threshold question. Is the creature real or is it a hoax? It's a complexity for and uh, the, it unlocks the next question once you answer it. And so let me note that really quickly. But if you want just a sort of a, you know, an afternoon at a pleasure garden, this is a great opportunity to do it. And so with all that said, let's get scenes going. I'm gonna go around the table, find out what everyone's interested in doing today. We'll start with, um, go in reverse order, Mr. Talford again, what are you interested in doing today? So I'm, I'm kind of digging this, this pleasure garden. So I'll head over there since I'm the guy. Yeah, sounds good. Um, what about you, Mr. Quinn? Um, I think I'm going to go Gaze on the masterwork in the daytime. <laughs> <laughs> you are going to have this scene no matter what. You're going to do it. Yeah, it's good. Um, well, Green, that sounds like you might have the day off then. What are you going to do? I think Green is interested in following up uh, something about La Autencia Fig. Um, so... I think um, hmm, 
maybe going back to that brothel to uh, yeah. ask some questions now after all the now that the excitement there yeah is excitement's over. died down yeah makes sense um mr nelson you're muted david thank you um i think after the excitement of the obert fig incident especially given that hank accidentally like hurt a kid there as well um, I think he would be looking forward to some distraction. He would probably join Mr. Talliford at the Pleasure Gardens. Sounds good. Um, do you want the scene on the way over or just you, or do you want a scene like together? Like how, let's, let's frame this up. I mean, let's talk about, we'll, we'll start there. Let's talk about the creature of Cremorne Gardens or this Pleasure Gardens, Cremorne Gardens. You know, the thing about it is in the day, it is, it does have quite a lot of people there. Um, it's much busier at night, however, but in the day, you see people sort of walking along these beautiful, these beautifully manicured sort of promenades. You see the old hedge maze, of course, which you're very familiar with, Mr. Talibert. Um, I think as you are sort of, you know, you're, you step through the gate. So basically the way it's situated is on, um, on the East End gate, that connects up to Chain Walk, which is a, basically a street in a little neighborhood, a sort of thriving or, or, or growing, burgeoning arts, com arts community, you know, painters and things. And then on the south end, the south gate entrance, that's Chelsea Harbor. And then you have the Pleasure Gardens sort of itself. And as you sort of come in, you know, you will hear a rapturous crowd applauding as a red and gold striped hot air balloon climbs into the air, right? And then somewhere else you hear a cry of distress from the crowd and then relief as the blondin, a blondin is what they would call a, um, uh, a tightrope walker, as a tightrope walker uh, wavers on the tightrope, nearly falls, but then recovers, right? And maybe of interest to you, Mr. Nelson, somewhere in the distance you hear the the pop of small arms fire <laughs> and the occasional shattering of milk milk bottles. Um, let's just have that scene with the two of you there having arrived. Uh, so Mr. Talliford, you were saying that you've been here before? Yeah, you know, um, I had, I was, I was looking to, you know, make ends meet and, you know, taking some some jobs here and there. Um, it was it was an experience, I'd say. Um, I didn't leave on bad terms per se. Well, well, what kind of terms did you leave on? Well, they they thought that I was a bit, you know. It's just I love I love my work too much. I think mm. is what they said uh, when they let me go and. Uh, suggested that they were looking for something a little more family friendly than what I was bringing, than the, the energy I was bringing to the to the show here. You know, uh, in my time knowing you, I I could see a perspective that would uh, agree with that. Uh, your experience here aside, uh, this creature that we're inquiring about. You, of course, are more deeply connected to the supernatural than I, although I, I have an eye Although we know it. what we know about you. Yeah. <laughs> you literally turned into a spider. <laughs> uh, do you have any insights that about what this creature could be or, or where, what they might be interested in? Well, I mean, my insight is that it's probably a man in a fish suit. That would be my first guess. You will overhear a woman, a voice you recognize, Abigail Simpson, Mr. Simpson's daughter. She's actually sort of runs the place. She says, I thought that was you, Mr. Talliford. And please don't tell me you're caught up in this fish man nonsense. So you don't believe in this fish man either. Abigail Simpson is, she's sort of a no-nonsense person. She wears very simple utilitarian clothing. Her hair is pulled back out of her, uh, of her shoulders. 
And I think she's there with a handyman named Sven, who you also know. And she says, the whole thing is completely preposterous. Trust me, if there were a fish man creeping about, my father would have already captured it, put it in a tank, raised a tent and charged an entry fee. Trust me, there's no such thing. Well, you know, I'm inclined to agree with you, honestly, but you know, it's, it's a job. I'm, I'm just here to check things out. She says, well, um, as long as you, as long as you don't um, interact with the guests in a problematic manner, as you did last summer, I think we'll probably be okay. I promise I will not remove my eye patch one time. She says, speaking of eyes, we have a new exhibit, Greco, the second sighted boy. And she points over at his tent. We see this sort of purple silk tent and there's a painting of Greco. And he has an eye on his forehead. Um, she says, he's doing a good job. He brings in good business. So what's the deal? Did you, you stick a pig eye on his forehead or something? Is that what's going on here? She says, oh, Mr. Talaford, you are surprisingly cynical. And she goes. Uh, well, back, all I know to... is that <laughs> when offered the chance at actual wonders and signs, you turned them down. So I can only assume that you're only interested in charlatanism. And Sven looks at you and says, that boy has real power and just sort of turns away. And Abigail says, enjoy your stroll, Mr. Talaford. If you do find any fishmen creeping about, let me know. Uh, You'll is, be the first is, I tell. Is Sven the one who runs the place? Uh, Sven is like a handyman. Abigail actually runs the place. Well, Abigail runs the place? Yeah. Um, uh, I, I'm going to try to catch up to Abigail uh, and, and say, uh, Actually, uh, speaking of interacting with... She says, yes, we actually have plenty of uh, American West uh, uh, American West sort of characters already at the American Bowling Saloon and the Shooting Gallery. We don't really have a position for you. I'm sorry. Well, I was, I was wondering if you wanted the genuine article. You see, uh, I uh, conquered the West a bit myself, uh, stemming from there, and I imagine that those you've gathered here are imitations. She says, you have a very thick accent, sir. Um, I'm not sure genuine is the adjective I would use to describe it. <laughs> uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a tad bit insulted if I'm, if I'm being right honest, but I, I understand a, a bit of hesitancy, but I, I can assure you that, I can assure you, I can assure you that, uh, my my family hails from across the pond, as you call it here. Yes, yes. Well, the, what what can I do for you? Well, I, along with Mister Talford, of course, are are interested in making sure that there really is no wet creature that's been bothering your establishment in the evenings. And in pursuit of that, uh, I'm rather handy with a, a pistol myself, and. I imagine that I could be of service here and keep an eye on the situation at the same time. She says, well, she does seem kind of open to the idea, mostly because all these stories in the tabloid have been causing, you know, agitation among the guests. Do the information move with, no, I think this is maybe the day move. Like, are you, what are you trying to accomplish here? I, I think less than gathering information, I think Hank is trying to get a, a sort of a job here. Oh, okay, um, I like it. So, yeah, okay. so that he, he can get <laughs> embedded. Do the day move uh, with presence. What are you afraid is going to happen if you lose your nerve or fail? Uh, I'm afraid she's going to turn me down. Okay. For sure. Go ahead and um, roll with presence and see how that goes. And we'll cut over to another character. Yeah. Um, 
if I leverage my copy of the Declaration of Independence to certify my Americanhood, uh, can I get advantage on this? I, I kind of love it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Work that into the scene, though. What do you do? What do you say? Uh, I think he he has like a uh, a, a pouch uh, on his side that he, he reaches into and he pulls out a folded uh, weathered document and he says, uh, my passport is uh, back at back at my place, uh, but I, I do have this to certify my authenticity. She may be charmed by this. Go ahead and roll. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that could have been better, but thankfully it's presence, right? Yeah. So uh, I do have a plus two to presence. So that turns that six and two and eight. Okay. She, uh... yeah, we'll come back to that. Um, okay. Let's cut over to green for a moment. So green during the day, the brothel is not as busy and you actually can have a little more run of the place. Did we name any NPCs there or any side characters? I can't recall. I, yes, I think so. The lady um, that uh, Green knew, um, but I don't remember. <laughs> the name as well. um, so, <clears throat> unless somebody um, wrote it in a little let know, we haven't been tracking our NPCs very well. Um, let's just make up a new character instead. <laughs> um, uh, maybe during the day, it's run by that woman's um, by that woman's son, we'll say. Um, we'll okay. call him John for now. And he, but he recognized you, right? Because you are a, a bit of customer's the right word, but you are a, a person who's there from time to time. He says, Mr. Green, this is interesting because people in this situation call you Mr. Green, right? Um, oh, uh, how, how can I help you? Um, most of the, uh, most of the uh, our employees are resting right now. Oh yes, yes. Uh, I, I, um, I was here during this uh, unfortunate incident uh, some time ago, uh, and they are looking around the place to see. It, like it, it, it looks like you have about. been able to yes. clean it, uh, and um, I'm I'm really sorry. Uh, it it was a terrible thing, disturbing. Uh, uh, the whole uh, uh, I mean you know I, th I think there was this woman and she was helping the kids here and somehow someone got murdered I it it was very confusing but uh, this well, this woman yes I know who you're talking about you're talking about Mrs. Fig and well it seems that in the days since that incident we've learned that the fig family is on the run from the police they've gotten up to some kind of dark business i don't know what no one has been at their shop their pie shop for for a number of days now and well we've heard all sorts of all sorts of things it's really too bad though because she was quite good with the children that's that's what uh, i heard and uh, so yes it's I, I suppose she hasn't been back since then but and i i've been kind of uh, interested in what what she wanted here apart do you think she was just interested in the children this is well i couldn't say I, I don't know for sure whenever she was here though that's where she spent most of her time in the back in that back room where the kids uh play um do you think she left anything here or what is this all about are you are you well, working for someone I'm uh, actually uh, just here because I think you, the children uh, now, they, they are deprived of this attention, right? They're probably asking themselves, uh, why is that nice lady not coming anymore? And uh, I think uh, if we can find out what happened here, then uh, maybe uh, someone else can take over. Or if it's all a big misunderstanding, maybe uh, Mrs. Fick can come back. He says, hmm, well, I mean, you're certainly happy to, to take a look around if you think that you, she might have left something that will allow you to find her. And maybe, maybe all of this is just a, a big misunderstanding. Maybe she's covering for her sons or her husband. I don't know. But um, you're welcome to take a look. I mean, I just yeah. want to make sure that she is actually involved with all of this business that her family is running from. Yeah, so that back room where they sort of like let the kids hang out um, while their mothers work, 
um, is empty at the moment. Um, but you can see, let's do a paint the scene. How do we know that this is a space for children? I think there's a top shelf um, that is the children cannot reach, but there's a couple of like little toys and so on uh, up there. Um, Uh, there's just an adorable mural painted on the wall. Uh, I think there's been an effort made uh, to like up upholster or soften the corners of some tables and chairs and things. Uh, there are a few pieces of child-sized furniture. Very good. Um, we'll come back to this moment. And... Actually, no, let's get a die roll on the table. Green, what do you do when you're there? Um, I think they would take a look around if maybe, you know, if she actually spent time there playing with the kids. And so maybe she left something on the shelf or, you know, um, and if, if I wouldn't find anything, I think the next thing is interested to see if I can find any of the kids to talk to them, but. Yeah, sounds good. Do a uh, information move with reason seems fine. That is, uh, let's see, uh, eight on the die, nine. Nine. Okay, we'll come back to that. So, Mr. Quinn, <laughs> you get to go have your scene with your statue. Um, you're in control here. Set it up for us. What's going on? Uh, so, um, I think that uh, it's actually stemming from my obsession now with the camera and this need to be. Um, photograph by the camera which is fighting a little with like I think the the rational part of my brain it's like this is weird so uh I'm going to I think my my night face will be to go get photograph of the camera but so before that I'm making my preparations and I'm like dressing nice and all that stuff and on the way I'm going to stop at the masterwork and just gaze upon my own beauty obviously you know check in with my followers and maybe see if I can get some information about the universe and the camera and what's up with it. So let's read your Cosmic Passage move because you get a move from the Cosmic Passage, yeah. which says, let's find it here. Um, gotta find this part of the character sheet. Oh, here we go. Uh, whenever you gaze upon the masterwork in an attempt to uncover something hidden in the world, roll with sensitivity. Go ahead and roll. You want me to just do it right away? Yeah, just roll, yeah. All right. That's going to be a tan. Nice. The masterwork will reveal a clue or a mastermind clue, your choice. Um, for now, though, just give us a little more of the scene. What's happening here? Yeah. So um, I walk into the previously established gardens. In the daytime, I think there's less of my followers around because there's like more. They're still there, but it's a little less obvious. More likely people might kind of wander in um accidentally um and so i take time i one of the things i like to do i think is collect some of the flowers uh that so that green can use them for dyes uh for my garments so that they're extra unique so i take some time to do that uh and then when it's quiet and like people all of my followers kind of like back away when i come in but when anyone else who might be wandering around sort of leaves i just take uh there's like one specific bench i like to sit on that i think gets my best angle although they're all good uh, in which i can just sort of bask in my own beauty <laughs> so you want a clue or a mastermind clue i think i want a clue okay it makes the most sense and for uh the way the camera yeah okay we'll come back to that Okay, so Mr. Talford, you are at Cremorne Gardens. What are you doing after you've had your little run in with Abigail Simpson? So I feel like this whole situation is making me extremely petty. And I just want to like heck all this, this fortune telling kid. I want to show this kid off. <laughs> Very good. Um, okay, so let's talk about, um, let's talk about that. 
So, Greco, the second sided boy, he's, you know, the tent is there and you can go in and pay your uh, appropriate amount of Victorian coinage to, to have your fortune read if that's what you wish to do. Do you go inside? Uh, well, before I do that, I'm going to do a ritual to um, start channeling some, some of the good stuff so I can out-prophecy this kid. <laughs> Very good. Um, so which move are you tapping into here? Uh, I think I'm going to do the Rites of Salt and Smoke. Okay, nice. And so uh, give us the uh, setup. What's the, what's the ritual look like? So um, I think I go buy a turkey leg. Okay. And like, this is going to be my, my burnt offering. And so okay, I have a good. very like fairground centric little ritual going here. <laughs> so, like it, yeah. <laughs> so I get this turkey leg and like some mulled wine or something, whatever they're offering is refreshments. And that's yeah. like my, my drink offering and my burnt offering <laughs> that I'm going to do in a little makeshift barrel or something that I can find. Um, yeah. And I think like, I think I'm specifically reaching out to Mr. Bell on this. Cause I think like, he understands my petty impulses. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, I love it. Is your crow with you right now? It is, yes. What does your crow think about you feasting on a turkey leg? <laughs> um, I think he's I think he's into it. I think he eats some of it too. Crow are, crows are nasty, man. So he also has a taste for it as well, then. Oh, I think so, yeah. <laughs> very good. Yeah, very good. Um, I would like to know because of your condition, a taste for it. Um, in what ways is the turkey leg disappointing? Um, yeah, I mean, it just tastes like flavorless. Like, it's just like chewing cardboard, essentially. Like, um, it, it holds no appeal to me. Because I think, you know, before, like, before I would offer it to Mr. Bell, I would also take a bite, typically. And I think I'd bite it and just spit it right back out. Like, oh, in interesting. Go ahead and roll the dice. Let's see how it goes. All right. Uh, actually, can I use my crow on this? Oh, uh, what sort is of. The, what's the crow um, do? Seeing distant seeing places. Seeing distant places. So I guess it kind of depends on what. What are you trying to accomplish? Yeah, I guess maybe not because I think I I think I have like less specific goals in mind. So I'm looking for the effect of do one thing that's beyond human limitations. Mm. I mean, you uh, might have since a, I don't might have something really else know what's your, coming. You might have something else in your personal quarters that would apply, possibly. Uh, you know, toss some of Julius's ashes somewhere or something like that. I don't know. Or, or <laughs> grave. Uh, Who knows? I might read some passages from the Book of Mormon as, okay, I'm, as I'm doing this. I'm curious why. <laughs> um, you know, like, I mean, I think that just in general, my thing is like perverting Christian oh, I see. rituals, okay. right? So like reading passages from the Book of Mormon, I think lines up with that. This is an um, incredibly new religion at this time right like right yeah like wildly new right right like very so that's intriguing um okay interesting uh go ahead and mark it and roll your dice at advantage right. fine um that is in it's an 8 plus 3 11 so you get um You get what you want. What's your effect you're going for? Uh, I just want to do one thing that is beyond human limitations. Mm. And so I would like to just have, sort of interpret that as like... Okay, very good. That's good. Yeah, prophecy or whatever. Power, yeah, so right, yeah. I'm just charged up on Mr. Bell juice at the very moment. Good. Reading the words of the prophet Joseph Smith. Has, has exactly. Viewed you with prophecy. Good. Let's cut back over to Mr. Nelson. Mr. Nelson, um, what was your die result again? You get the mid result, uh, right? It was an eight on the die, yeah. or total, rather. She says, you know, we actually could, it would actually would be nice to have maybe someone visibly working security just to make the guests feel a little more comfortable. I will have to say, however, if you don't want to draw a lot of unwanted attention, you're going to have to come dressed a little bit more well, a little more London. With well, current. If, if we're trying dress. to, 
if, if we're trying to be in line with some of the features here at your pleasure gardens i think i would look even more at home in what i'm wearing right now well it's just that you're going to get lots of people who are going to want to come up and hear your stories oh well i've got a story or two to tell all right then if you're okay with uh being a conspicuous uh security guard then certainly we could use some help tonight we have quite a lot of people expecting quite a lot of people uh, on the um, uh, what we call it the, the dancing platform tonight. This dancing platform is huge. It's like a large pagoda, and it can actually hold four thousand dancers. It's so enormous. <laughs> yeah, it's really big. Um, she says things get a little carried away, and then of course, if someone claims to have seen the creature of Cremorne Gardens, we could have. It could be a dangerous situation. There could be panic. Well, uh, from my experience rustling cattle out in the West, I, I find that people are hardly any different when it comes to panic situations. She shakes your hand and you have a job. Let's Excellent. go to Green. Green, you did an information move. What was your die result? Nine. Nine. Mm -hmm. You are looking around the children's room and you find a book of nursery rhymes. It, there's nothing remarkable about that in the space, except if you slip through the pages, all the references to birds have been crossed out. So Mother Goose is just Mother crossed out. Um, four and 20 crossed out, right? Like it's, it's bird references have been struck from the pages. It's an unusual detail that sticks out, probably a clue. What would you do after that? I think uh, Green um, kind of, yeah, looks through this book and around the room and then they put it in, like they, they take it with them, put in a little bag. Let me give you your complication um, as well. It's not really a complication. It's actually more information, mm -hmm. but it's maybe the equivalent of encountering something terrible in Trophy Gold, say. You, one of the sex workers there, a woman who you recognize, her name is Candace. She's um, sort of steps into the room. She's wearing kind of a house coat. It looks like she came to go find a toy and she sees you there and she says, Oh, I'm just getting a note that we already have this clue. Do we already have this clue? <laughs> Let me look. It sounded familiar to me too. Actually. Yeah, it's not. It's not on the list, but I I remember that description. Right, it's pretty distinctive. Oh, um, but it's not like written down though. Did we like erase? I, it? I wonder if we just forgot to write it down. Yeah, I feel like it must have just fallen through the cracks and not actually get gotten written down. Oh, how intriguing. Well, you have it now, so <laughs> we'll love <laughs> That's right. It's official. <laughs> um, let's, uh, yeah, so this woman, Candace, comes in and she sees you and she says, oh, um, sorry, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to, to, to bother you. Um, I overheard you talking to John earlier about that fake woman. Oh, yes, uh, you know, uh, she was always in here with the children, right? Yes, yes. Um, she was she was a nice enough woman, although one time she told me a story that I have to admit was a bit disturbing. I understand. You know, this this is uh, that's why I I think that, like I told John, uh, I'm interested because the children. Uh, you know they are they are now left alone so we it, it, we need to either know whether uh, this is all a misunderstanding and uh, miss fig will come back to take care of the children and, or uh, uh, that it's actually that she is involved with this dark business that her family has been accused of and then uh, we need to tell the children that she will not be coming back right we cannot leave them in this uh, in between well <clears throat> i I know that she is in fact very, very dedicated to children, her own children. Well, this story, it's perhaps a bit ghoulish for this early in the day, but you know she's, she's missing an arm. 
And to hear her tell it, she speaks quite openly about it. Her, she and her sons, when they were very little, got trapped in a cave or a mine or something, but they were trapped. And rather than watch them starve, she made it so that her boys could eat her arm to stay alive. I've heard that that particular incident at least partially explains why the Fig family has such, well, I suppose you might say that they have found particular ways of dealing with that trauma. Well, there, there seems to be something about her. Uh, do you think, uh, I would really like to know if the children can, uh, this, but, but, and I think, I think Green, they're only kind of realizing that they know this, the story is, yes, I, I think you're right. This is, I hope she didn't speak about it in front of the children. No, no, she would never do that. But uh, I, I don't know. When I heard that her son might have been involved in what happened here to that police constable and how her family might be involved in what's going on, with, uh, that there might be some, some, some sort of something going on that, with them. I, 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 I just love that story. And I thought that, well, every family has their, you're, has their you're dark right. history. Uh, you know, I've, uh, now that I'm here, uh, and I think uh, Green, they take out this, the book of nursery rhymes and say, do you think, uh, I mean, I could, I could read to the children for, for a moment. Uh, nobody has been around for them for a couple of days. Oh, um, I, I think that would be nice. Yeah, that'd be nice. It's certainly easier if someone's looking after them. And well, um, well, if I'm being perfectly honest, business has kind of dropped off a little bit the last few days. I understand. And she, um, she finds what she was looking for, the toy. She says, for my boy. And she leaves. Mr. Quinn, you're getting a clue about the Waitley camera from staring, gazing upon your statue. And let me take a quick look at what the clues we already have, because we have quite a lot already. We have the replica, warm spice mills. Oh, the po oh, the the play. Okay, good. <laughs> Make what you will of this. One of your followers approaches you and says, my Lord, I have a gift, a gift to give you, and I hope you will receive it in a way that indicates it is pleasing to you. What do you say? I just, I'm gonna, I stare at this follower. I don't generally talk to them, I feel like, unless it's really important. Also, it's unusual. It would be very unusual, unusual to approach me. Yeah. So I'm just kind of staring and waiting awkwardly. He says, he, he steps aside to show you the gift that he's set down. It is an albino peacock in a crystal cage. Like alive? It's alive, yeah. <laughs> you know what, I think that's super cool. That <laughs> does please me. That's bizarre and I love it. How is this connected to the Waitley camera? I don't know, but 
this is what the situation is presented to you. What do you do, do with the, to, what do you do with the I was gift? Say, do I get to add it to my personal You, you can add to your personal quarters, yeah. If you um, want yeah. to take it. I'm going to take it. I won't carry it though. I will make my followers carry it for me since green isn't here. Mm, very good. Yeah, add that to your PQ. And what was your die result? 10. Okay. So then, yeah, you're, you got it clean then. Okay. So let's pick back up with Mr. Talliford. Mr. Talliford, you're all primed and ready to go. What do you do? Um, so I think I'm, you know, I am like just completely juiced at this moment. Like I think I'm barely in control of my actions. So I'm, I just like walk straight into the tent like I am the place and we're gonna see what's going on. You step inside the tent and you see um, a young man who you have to assume is Greco, the second-sided boy. He's wearing, we'll call it, quote, mystical face paint. He has a jewel affixed to his head representing his third eye. He does have a sort of like distant manner of speech. Like when you walk in, he doesn't even like acknowledge you at first. He's sitting at a little table, which has been draped with a velvet cloth. And he looks up at you and he says, Ah, Mr. Talliford, I knew you were going to be here today. Um, is there anybody else in here with us? Nope. Mm, that's gonna throw a kink in my plan to publicly shame him. I guess I'll have to just privately shame him. Um, he says, you have the power of sight. You have the power to see beyond the veil. What, for what reason could you possibly need my services? Oh, I don't. But surely you knew that, right? He smiles and says, you wish to enact harm upon me. I can sense that on you. You have petty vengeance on your heart. Well, if it makes you feel better, it's nothing personal about you. I know that. So, Mr. Talliford, how shall we cause your urge to be spent? Well, I mean, I think you could just go into your routine and at the appropriate time, I will interrupt you and shame you. He says, if we wait but a moment, a woman, a woman who wishes to make contact with her deceased husband will be here. You can sit with us as if you were my assistant. I think I'm like weirdly knocked off balance by how accommodating this kid is being, but uh, I'm gonna go along with it. Um, I'm, I feel, I'm feeling a little bit defused, but we're gonna okay. go along with it. If you wait a bit, she comes in and she says, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, am I interrupting? I, I, I thought, I thought, I thought it was, I thought uh, I'll come back. And he says, no, no, don't worry about Mr. Talliford. He's here doing a performance review. And she sits down and she says, she says how her husband's been dead now for several months. Um, she wants to make contact with him. She wants to know that he's at peace wherever he's at. And Greco, Mr. Talford looking at him, how do you know that Greco knows what he's doing? Um. I think that I can sense him tapping into spirits. Like he does it the exact same way I do. Like, and I can just literally see the power flowing into him. Yeah. You have the ability to, to either, you, you can also, I suppose, be like trying to draw forth her husband. You can, interact in the situation because you have this like power from the ritual right now 
What do you think you're going to do with it, if anything? I think that I want to know all of the things that her husband kept from her while she while he was alive. Like, I want to just reveal all of his darkest secrets. Oh, I like it. That's really good. Um, I'll let you come up with the secrets. Uh, you can say whatever you think they are uh, as, as a player, and I'll go with it. But I'm curious, like, what are you hoping to accomplish vis-a-vis -vis Greco? I don't even think I know. Like, I think I just want to ruin his ruin his day. And like, I want this lady to just like leave regretting that she ever met Greco. <laughs> Very good. This is a, this is a dire scene. Um, I like it. It is 100% petty. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, good. We'll pick back up with this in a moment. Let's go to Mr. Nelson. Mr. Nelson, you got your job. Anything else you want to do while you're here? Uh, <clears throat> I think at first he, after uh, tracking her down and getting the job, I think at first he looks around for Mr. Talliford, who has disappeared yep. um, into the tent, of course. Uh, and so in lieu of that, I think he's going to go over and try to show up everyone at the shooting games. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, there is a little shooting gallery. It's right next door to the American Bowling Saloon. And yeah, um, you can do that. No problem. Um, are you just putting on a show or are you trying to get people to open up to you or what so i think i'm gonna put on like i'm definitely uh you know i've puffed out my chest a little bit be, being as big as and as obvious as i can uh and i'm gonna like try to make a show of of besting this game very easily and then basically have having gathered a few people uh have a chat with them uh maybe get a little bit of information as well yeah i like it you can uh take advantage from your gun and um, roll with presence to see how you okay. do here. Woohoo, that is double sixes. Nice. Um, lots of 14. We'll come back to that in a moment. Um, Green, what are you gonna do post uh, finding the Book of Nursery Rhymes? Uh, I think walking over to like kind of listening to see if I can hear any kids. Where, where if the kids are not in this room, if there are, if there are some kids around, um, I think they mostly spend the day with the parents, right, or the mothers. Okay. Um, I think Green is kind of wander, gonna wander. They are gonna wander around the place for a while um, because they really would like to talk to one of the children um, quickly. Like if if they can tell us anything about Laurentia. Yeah. yeah, we can make that happen. That sounds good. And then um, we'll. Mr. Quinn, what are you going to do once you now that you with peacock in tow, <laughs> albino peacock in tow? Uh, I think I'm just going to return to get ready for going to be photographed by the Whitley camera tonight. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Let's take a quick five minute break and we will come back. Let's pick up the scene, Mr. Talliford. You. I think that, I think it starts like very, um, you know, Greco is definitely holding back. He's saying in sort of vague terms, like sort of, yes, your husband's fine. He's, you know, he's at peace. Um, you know that Greco knows what the truth of the matter is, but he's being very like, not, he's not trying to upset this woman, right? And, maybe this is kind of like his mandate from the Simpsons, right? Like you were supposed to give good, good readings and good predictions and, and the ghost should always be very happy and uh, at peace. What do you do? Um, so I think I'm just going to call him out. Like, I think it's, it's obvious that this woman's husband like hated her, just like visceral hatred. And like, I think that's why he's at peace is like in his mind he's finally like doesn't have to deal with her anymore um, oh so how i think do i'm you, just calling uh, him out i'm like so yeah. so greco why aren't you actually saying what the husband what this one poor woman's husband is saying greco says sometimes mr talliford it's best to give them milk before meat. That's a Mormon thing, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, I think I'm just gonna let the ghost use my body to do what to say whatever he actually wants to say. Yeah, I, I want to just know like how you are physically changing like in this moment to we're gonna horrify the woman, right? And right, yeah, like what is what is what does this look like? Um, so I think you can see like the her husband's face sort of like superimposing on top of mine. And like my voice, like the register of my voice ticks up a little bit. I think I naturally have like a deeper voice than her husband did. And so I think like you can just see Talifird sort of adopting his mannerisms and even like starting to look like him. And after you're done like saying everything that her husband needs to say, her lower lip is quivering, tears are streaming down her face and she gets up and just like runs off right? And Greco looks up at you and says, do you feel better now? Um, I think at this point, like, yeah, I think like all of the supernatural stuff has drained out of me. And uh, I think I kind of feel like a piece of shit, honestly. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I really say anything. That's good. Well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's good. Well, I'll just I'll just leave. <laughs> Mr. Nelson, you overhear some interesting chatter that is your clue. Apparently, Madame Tussauds, which is a, technically a competitor with Cremorne Gardens because they are competing for people's time and attention. Madame Tussauds is getting ready to put on a Horrors of the Deep Waxwork exhibit. And that's your clue. Take a look at the, uh, make sure we're keeping up with our clues here. as you are stepping away from this crowd of pleasure seekers, you noticed on the way in that the gardens have these like large green emerald glass domes over the gas lights so that at night they cast this sort of like green glow. You'll notice that Sven and a few of the other workers are unscrewing the emerald green glass domes and they're reattaching sapphire blue glass domes around the gas lamps. But that's your clue, your mastermind clue. Uh, I think Hank would go over to uh, Sven and, and, oh, uh, fancying a change of pace. Sven says, oh, we have, uh, we have a special, uh, Someone has, someone has reserved all of Cremon Gardens a few nights hence for a special event. And they insist on this color being quite prominent. He'll, he'll file that away and say, oh, uh, I'll be sure to keep my schedule free then in case, in case they require my services. Green. You can find a little girl, kind of, uh, you know, um, I don't know, whatever, whatever the hell kids do in the middle of the day, I don't know. Um, <laughs> what, what do you do? <laughs> uh, hey, wait. Uh, uh, do you know this book? And I think they should, this nursery book. Yeah, and she says, and she'll tell you that you know, Mrs. Fig would frequently read the nursery rhymes from the book. What is your favorite uh, one? Do, do you remember? And um, she will tell you, I think she was maybe partial to, I don't know, nursery rhymes. Um, oh, Jack Spratt could eat no fat. No, he likes, 
She likes that one. Do you know, uh, last time that this this woman came in, she was always uh, very nice, right, with, with you. Uh, what did did she bring sweets? Did she ever bring any treats? Uh, do the information move with uh, presents. That's a that's a um, five. Five. I think I'm gonna mark a mask. Okay. But, yeah. <laughs> Don't want to. Oh yeah, but actually, you first have to. Yeah. That's up to you. I mean, we'll just go straight to it. But I will say that because you're marked by La Hortensia, out of character, La Hortensia is very, very good at laying traps. It's sort of how she functions compared to Obert. And you will step into one of her traps. Unless you want to mark the Janice mask. No, let's go for it. Uh, the trap. Mm. You are, she's, the little girl's talking to you and you know, it's, it's all fine. And kind of keeping with this gas lamp theme, you will notice now that one of the gas lamps is not lit, but is definitely still like there's gas hissing. And what do you do? Do you, uh, I, I think we should, we should go. Um, do you smell, uh, where's John? And John will, can be there. Are you gonna try to like get everybody out of there or what are you gonna do here? I think, yeah, I think uh, Green is gonna kind of try to take uh, the girl to John and then, you know, one of the lamps seemed to be, there's, the, there's a gas leak. Uh, if, if, you, if you don't want another tragedy happening, uh, today, I suppose you should take care of it quickly. Let's just do the day move. What are you afraid is going to happen if you fail right now? Uh, I think he is just going to ignore it as like something that, you know, whatever. Interesting. Uh, go ahead and roll with co well, composure. This is in your wheelhouse. Although at a disadvantage, though, because you're marked by La Hortensia. Um. Sure. Mm. All right. Let's see. Uh, that is still an eight plus three, so eleven. Clean success. How do you? What does it look like? How is this danger averted? Um, I think, uh, John, like might be reluctant in the beginning, but then, uh, it, it, he sees how, um, agitated green has quickly become. Uh, and I think, uh, luckily John knows, uh, exactly where to turn off, uh, the gas for this uh, building. I think they might have had a tr some trouble with one of the lamps before or something. So in the end, I think it's it, it's this kind of very tense moment, but it very quickly, like all the tension floods from it because John just knows where to turn it off, turns it off. And then it's like, the, yeah, we, we have this all the time and, you know, good. just I have like to it. ask for someone to repair it. Let's go to the desk phase. All right, Mr. Nelson, give us the quickening. Let's see how this goes. We're having spider shenanigans tonight. That was almost bad, almost bad. 
because uh, one of those is a one, but the other one is a six. So that's a seven uh, and that's on sensitivity. So that is a nine. Okay, so you'll take drained, but otherwise you're fine. Ghost of Hargrave House, anything being purloined green? Um, mm, I think, um, yeah, I, I mean, I want to try to give the other Bible back to Teleford and kind of uh, exchange it back for the Book of Mormon. And, <laughs> you know, very good. Very good. Very good. And let's, how has the Bible changed the one that you took and gave back? I think I'm uh, green is coming out to Mr. Teleford's room and knocking. And says like, uh, I have something. Uh, okay. Uh, here, I thought you. Um, th this seemed this seemed to be uh, valuable to you, so uh, I hope this helps to protect it. And uh, Green gives it back, and it's in this beautiful like little satchel that someone tailored particularly for the book. Huh, look at error. Very good, Green, thank you. <laughs> good. Um, Do you want me to make another one for uh, for this? I see. Oh, yeah, you have yeah that, would be, that would be excellent. Okay, it, it has slightly different dimensions, so uh, let me take it for a moment. Oh, sure, yeah, take your time. Day work, which option do you choose for day work, Green? Uh, I think um, what is the last, the first one about the clue, what is the last trap that Hortensia Fick uh, uh, sprang on someone? Mm. Not a clue, just an answer. You will realize now that you'll start to make kind of a connection between some things that have happened and what you just experienced. Over the last few months, there have been incidents of gas leaks causing fires and people running out of buildings. And some of the people running out of the buildings disappear. Most likely the figs were grabbing people. They were using the chaos to grab people to make into pies after La Hortensia set the buildings on fire. Not a clue, but information. And let's take a look at unquenchable thirst. Hmm, interesting. I don't think anything really applies there as far as conditions go. And so, Let's talk about Hargrave House. Today for Hargrave House, we're going to be talking about the dining room. You all don't often take meals together, but tonight is an exception. What's on the menu? Some unmarked pies. It's just a bit of bit of gallows humor there, getting some pies in to have. <laughs> I think. I think uh, oh, go ahead. Pies. <laughs> I think Green uh, brought a, a bottle of like fake wine maybe to kind of taunt Julius a bit, like thick blood red wine. Uh, I, I think Hank uh, prepares and brings proper biscuits. 
not not those not London cookies kind. <laughs> not those not those cookies proper biscuits uh, I think that um, I have acquired just the most luxurious dessert you can imagine. It's so rich. It's so pretty, but it's also very tiny in that classic, like, rich person way. Very interesting. Hmm. All right. What's everyone doing tonight? Uh, Mr. Nelson, what you're thinking? Work and security. Hank's going to go to work. Uh, yeah, he's going to go and uh, see what he can see. I think, um, yeah, I think he's just going to like sort of patrol and look for suspicious stuff. Okay, sounds good. Um, Mr. Talford, what are you up to tonight? So I'm kind of interested in that camera. I don't know if we want to roll the, uh, if we want to try to actually figure out the ritual or not. That's what I was thinking. Maybe we try to do that since I was intent on going to get photographed by it anyways. Yeah. Right. I will say just as a sort of out of character consideration, um, Alicia, I know you have to leave early and I don't think you want to miss the what happens once the camera happens. Um, <laughs> so yeah, fair enough. You may all want to put that aside until next time uh, just as a out of character consideration, but it's up to you. So. Yeah, that's fair. So I can do something else. Um, yeah. Come back to me, actually, if you don't mind, Ben. Okay, fair enough. Uh, well, in that case, um, Mr. Quinn, what are you up to? I guess I won't go. Well, you can have your photo. You can have your photo taken without without solving the the thing, right? Without, that's true. Like, you can just that's go there true. If, you know, get more. Sure, we'll do that. Yeah. Uh, Green. Green first wants to answer a question, or at least the whole group uh oh, and then Latencia? yeah okay uh that sounds good we can do that in a moment and mr talford any thoughts then so i think i'm going to talk to mr bell i think okay. i have things to say after You're today supposed, you all so. were supposed to be delivering julius at some point too right right uh, yeah there was a plan, so I, right <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of things that we need to discuss i think yeah that sounds good to me okay uh green let's talk about or actually everybody Adrian, it sounds like you have a, a theory here. So what's your theory about? <clears throat> so we do have a picture of Laotensia on a farm surrounded by chicken and we chickens, and we have a book of nursery rhymes with reference to birds crossed out. So I think um, I think what uh, she is trying to, what she lost and is trying to recapture is like um, a uh, childhood home that burned down also maybe from a gas leak or something. Um, and it's, maybe it was a farm uh, that had these, you know, these chickens and other birds. Um, mm. So I think um, we might we might find her somewhere where there is um, like a bird, uh, you know, where, where she can spend time with birds. That we have a lot has, of bird themes uh, going on yeah. tonight. So this uh, yeah. could be yeah interesting. Uh, if everyone agrees with this theory, it seems reasonable to me. Um, go ahead and roll. See how it goes. Right, so that's a flat roll, flat I guess. Roll. Uh, let's see. That's a five. Mm. So uh, you have some options here. I will have a reaction, which will probably F up all of your night uh, phase plans, which could be fun, but you know, just know. Um, or everyone could mark uh, Janice Mask. You do have one available on uh, Chromon Guards. Oh, not available for this though. You have to. You'd have to do the Mask of the Pig, which I think you all used already, if I'm not mistaken. You did. So it would be your own Janus masks. Everybody has to mark one if you want to avoid the knight really, really belonging to me. <laughs> I think Mr. Nelson is like running low on masks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't. I don't particularly view that as a bad thing, though. I yeah. I viewed Hank as he's a burning you're trying to burn, fast you're character. You're burning, burning him up fast, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's just the way he is. So, um, if if we'd like to avoid that, uh, I'm happy to do so. I, admittedly, I do kind of want to just hang out at the the pleasure gardens and and have you know that experience. So, uh, I wouldn't mind marking a mask and not having things go absolutely wild this particular evening. Okay. 
Yeah, I'd be happy to mask one, to mask one. Okay, is everybody I'm happy? I'm leaving to? soon, so I'll do whatever anybody wants to do. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can mark, that's fine. Okay, so then that bumps it up to A. Um, uh, you're correct, however, when you do make your attempt at luring La Hortensia to you, it will be a, it will be a fight. She's not gonna go quietly, but you are correct. And so that's good. Uh, well, then with all that said then, Green, what are you gonna do tonight? Um, I, I guess then trying to find her like where she is with all the birds yeah. and- uh, Yeah, sounds good. Uh, okay, we'll talk about that when we get to the night phase then. Okay, good. Uh, so that's everyone, right? Accounted for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's. Um, so I'm actually, I'm debating going back and uh, refining mine and okay, just sure. saying that I should just make a move on Julius. Okay. And actually like go a little <laughs> harder tonight and just okay, try sure. and resolve this Julius situation. Okay, that sounds good. He, you can, you can get the jump on him while he's before he gets out of bed, <laughs> right? right yeah. <laughs> if you wish. Uh, okay, good. All right. Well, that sounds fun. Um, okay. So uh, at this point, if anybody wants to do their Janus mask thing now, they can, or you can wait till the dawn phase. It's up to you. Any takers? No. And in that case, let's do the unseen then. Hmm. Do we have some theoretically or thematically rather interesting unseens to do here? Have we done the cult of the pig yet? I don't think we have. Let's do the cult of the pig. Our memory of Obert. So this is the second row from the bottom, the second one on the second one in the row. A secretive cult dedicated to the pagan swine god Mok has gathered in a fashionable salon on this holy night to make offerings to their piggy deity. Paint the scene, of course, is everyone. And I'll leave you out of this, Alicia, since you're leaving. David will be the first. And Dan, then Adrian. Let's take a three minute break. Come back. It is the night phase. The cult of the pig. Everyone, how has this otherwise sumptuously decorated salon been changed to make it a ritual space? dedicated to an ancient pagan pig god, the great he sow Mok. So there's a there's a trough lining one wall and they they carry hors d'oeuvres in and dump them into the trough that they all have to eat out of. I think that the wallpaper is like it's beautiful and it's intricate and you wouldn't notice but a closer um look has the pattern as little like hooves. I like it. I think that there's a chandelier uh, that is at least partially constructed out of like bone. I think um, there is, uh, everybody's wearing like a pig's foot around the neck on a little string. I'm gonna save Mr. Quinn for last but then have that kind of extended scene with Mr. Quinn because Alicia has to go. So instead we will start with Mr. Nelson. Cremorne Gardens is quite different at night. Um, you do see that the space is bathed 
in a um, combination of emerald green and sapphire blue. They haven't made all the changes yet <laughs> um, or with, on, the, on the, the, the glass globes, but that, that, that dancing platform, I mean, there's like a, you know, there's a bandstand where the band is and then the platform itself, I mean, there are just hundreds of people like, um, you know, champagne and, and stuff is flowing. There's a banqueting hall as well that is filled with people like having dinner and stuff. Um, just laughter, revelry. I mean, it is a, it is a wild scene. Um, yeah, just, I mean, just, 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 just alive. What, um, you know, people running out of the, the hedge maze, like, you know, terrified, you know, terrifying each other, you know, as they kind of run out. You uh, get your marching orders to just sort of like roam around and keep an eye on things. What are you doing right now? I think that, um, I think that how Hank would at least begin the evening would be by trying to find a, a higher point in the grounds and just kind of see how the crowds are moving um, and then go wherever he thinks makes sense based on that. Okay, we'll come back to it. Green, where are you looking for La Hortensia at, knowing what you know about her? Um... Maybe there is like a like a zoological garden or so where they have put up like a kind Maybe of like area. a simulacrum. Oh, you can hear me. So I can hear you. Yeah, go ahead, keep going. Okay, so yeah, like a simulacrum of a farm at the zoological <laughs> garden or something like that. You know, for the for the people in the city, kind of this kind of idealized version of like. Yeah. A, farm so this maybe maybe tonight's like the opening night of this particular exhibit that's that's good i like it um <laughs> we're, we're, we're in a very sort of like headspace certain headspace today which is good uh let's do a paint the scene everyone how um like this is a really really like family friendly sort of like exhibit i'm curious just like how are the, how are the, what, what sorts of things that they set up for the kids? Like, what does this look like? Um, how is this, how do we know this is a family friendly London at night? I think there's a station where you can uh, like, where they show you how to milk a cow and you can have that experience. I think you can feed chickens, you know, like seeds. So I think you can hear like there's a calliope that's just going in the background and you can hear from like all over the, the area. I think there's a wall of children's artwork, like they can come and do like a coloring contest or something of the animals. That's good. Here might be a good point to mention that we do have an aspect of the Janus mask available for the Cremorne Gardens threat, which is called the Mask of Revelry. Mr. Talliford, speaking of revelry, you can hear Julius in his room having his uh, early evening um, ablutions, singing to himself. He's singing a little song. I'm going to find someone who's Blood is fresh and hot, fresh and hot, and drink it down. And he's just kind of going on and on. What do you do? Okay, so I think I want to, like all of my, all of my ritual effects are sort of what I want, um, but um, so I think I want to like tie him sort of to, the box of ashes from his grave so that I can lure him to Mr. Bell's house. Very good, I like it. Um, okay, we'll, we'll 
we'll just put a pin in that for now. And uh, we had a question uh, if we can retcon to say that this little farm exhibit is actually at Cremorne Gardens. Yes, I love that. That sounds great. So we will do that. Let's link into Mr. Quinn for a little bit. I'm sure it's not the first time they've heard that. Um, Mr. Quinn, the Society of Square is also quite alive with activity. It is a fun night in London. You can see that the full society is there tonight. There are people coming in and out of the townhouse. You hear music. Um, uh, Periwinkle is dressed, how is Periwinkle dressed now? Mm. Periwinkle is dressed like, um, oh, I think he's like wearing like a little safari outfit uh, with a little safari hat. And he's, um, he's, you know, serving drinks and things to everyone. And that, that is the theme of the night. Like everyone is there sort of like uh, in safari gear or like stuff that is almost certainly like culturally appropriative going on, like, you know, with their dress. And then you show up, right? And are you on theme? What, what are you, how are you dressed tonight? I am decidedly not on theme. Um, I think that themes are extremely gauche. Not <laughs> okay, about good. that life. And also, side eye at the obvious racism happening in the society. Um, I am wearing, I need, hold on, I need my reference photo. Okay, so I'm wearing, it's all purple. I love purple. It's a common color for... Mr. Quinn to wear. Uh, so it's like some tighter pants, like a, a little like, almost like a bolero cape, you know, we've got these large shoulders down into this, I love a good cape, makes an excellent statement. And a huge hat, like a stiff brimmed wide hat, all in different shades of purple. And don't forget gloves, always, always gloves. Um, these ones, long opera length gloves to match. I love it, yeah, it's good. You were greeted at the door by Portia Abernethy. Portia is wearing a beautiful uh, caftan, uh, sort of um, same color, kind of a sort of violet caftan. And she's done up like a sort of like bird of paradise situation. That's kind of what's going on with feathers and things. And she sees you and she says, Mr. Quinn, I thought I was going to be the star of the evening, but it seems I have been outshone yet again. Yes, well, was that ever going to be a question? And she says, do come in. I think that everyone will love to marvel at your ensemble this evening. I know they will. And I just like walk in like I own the place. Yeah, and everyone, the conversation stops. Everyone's like, hub, up, hub, up, hub, up, hub, up. And Portia says, Mr. Quinn has been trying to get here for several nights now because they wish to be photographed by the Waitley camera. And everyone's like, hub, 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 hub. And one of the members of the society says, even after what happened to that poor actress? Especially because of what happened to that poor actress. And another member of the society says, well, Mr. Quinn, certainly we would be very enthusiastic about turning the lens on such a fascinating subject. What sort of composition would you prefer? Just me, please. A simple portrait, nothing to attempt to overshine, not that it could, my fabulousness. And Periwinkle offers up to Portia. He says, well, we actually, um, well, 
I just finished, I just, I just finished rearranging the astral plane room. And since Mr. Quinn has arrived in such an otherworldly costume, perhaps that would be the perfect setting. Portia says, what say you, Mr. Quinn? Sure, fine. And everyone will funnel you into the astral plane room. We've seen the astral plane room already, yes. Strange objects. Mm -hmm. Here, though, the astral plane room is actually, especially once they bring the Waitley camera in, the astral plane room is actually humming with real power. You sense a shift, a change. It's subtle, perhaps, but everyone in the society knows it. And I think just as a sort of way of capping off this scene, I'm not going to make you roll or anything, but I'm going to give you a clue. Actually, it's not, that's, yeah, it's a clue. I mean, let's see how I want to frame it then. Let's do a paint the scene first, everyone. How do we know that as the Waitley camera is brought into the astral plane room, how do we know that the astral plane room is, is reacting? Like it's, it's physically reacting to the presence of the camera. In what ways? I think those we had said before, there was like the, like an iPad and like other modern day devices. I think they all light up suddenly, like they turn on. So you can see like when people move, you can see like sort of after, like photographic sort of after images like following them around. When these devices turn on, they actually do so with this kind of super engineered sound effect. Anything else that everybody? And so, they, you sit for your portrait, Mr. Quinn, and they take the photos. They don't know how to make the Waitley camera operate because as was revealed before in a previous session, they all received the steps in dreams and then as soon as they did it, it left them. So they're just using it like a regular camera. But once they're done, they show you the plates. And when they show you the plates, They show you, you, but they show you as if you had been photographed in the past, something about the past, an indication that the camera has perhaps always existed, even before there were cameras. But what do we see in the play? I think, I think you just see a pre-transition, Mr. Quinn, um, almost as if you were looking at their sister or something. Intriguing. And I think that feels like a good place to end that. Um, and Alicia, if you have to go, I will uh, thank you for your uh, your time. And uh, you owe me a Janus mask when you get back. <laughs> See you. Let's go to the cult of the pig. David. Mock demands a sacrifice of riches. What does the cult offer him? Describe the manner of the offering. 
Yeah. I, I think that there is kind of a, a shelf, uh, an altar before the trough um, that was described earlier. And uh, everyone in turn comes up and lays valuables on the altar. But I think the theme of this of this evening is everyone is has like rolled up paper that they put on the altar and you can see that these are all like either either bundles of paper money or stock certificates um and after a small pile of these rolls has been made everyone having contributed something to it um someone wearing a, a pig mask who is leading the proceedings comes over with a match that they strike and they burn this burnt offering to mock. Very good. Well, so now we know that Green and Mr. Nelson are actually in the same place. You're both in Kremlin Gardens, maybe different parts of Kremlin Gardens, but I think you'd be together if you wish. Um, Mr. Nelson, where did we leave you last time with the last uh, bit? What were you doing? Uh, I was sort of trying to find a uh, a spot where I could look over the gardens oh, right. and yeah. get a good bird's eye view of everything. Yeah. Take an information move with probably vitality, actually, but at disadvantage. Not awful. That is uh, seven on the dice plus uh, one for vitality. Very good. And Green, how do you know La Hortensia is here without seeing her? Um, I think there are some candy wrappers somewhere on the ground where she might have talked to some children like when I come closer to the exhibit. You can follow them like a trail and see her there. She's wearing a, a coat with a hood perhaps so that she's not identified by any police. And you see just her one arm sort of like passing out candy to the children coming out of the cloak. Mr. Talaford, tell us about your ritual. So I think I've gone to Mr. Bell's house and I've brought the, um, the jeweled box full of ashes from Julian's grave. So I don't even know that I know exactly what it is, but like clearly he has an emotional attachment to this thing. And right. so, um, so I think I put it on the, the altar in Mr. Bell's house and start the ritual there. Um, is this the beautiful version of Mr. Bell's house or the, the shitty version that <laughs> Mr. Nelson uh, experienced? It's the beautiful version. It's the only one I've ever seen. Uh, very good. Let's talk about your die roll. Um, taking a look at your conditions, I think you're okay to go as far as that goes. If you want to go ahead and mark those ashes, if you have those in your personal yeah. quarters, you'll be able to roll at roll at advantage. Go for it. That is an 11, like a 14. Oh, nice. So you get your little, uh, oh, you get to unmark Cosmic Passage if you wish. So, so what's, the, what's the deal with that? Because my reason or my sensitivity is already at three. So can I not undo it? Uh, so if we look at the move, I think it actually says what you do. Um, it says you have to ignore it if it's since you're right, already yeah. three. Yeah. So you have to just kind of plan for that basically in the beginning. Right. Yeah. Um, oh, well. we, uh, no, well, it's no big deal. Um, you're good though. Just uh, give us just the opening moments of the ritual. What does it look like? Um, so I think that um, we have like set everything up on the altar and um, I think, you know, like I always have to sacrifice something to bring Mr. Bell forth. And so I think that I have actually made like a monetary offering on the, on the altar and um, set up the candles 
and set up the, the box of ashes. And um, I think I just like start to ask Mr. Bell to, to make his presence known and to like attach, to tether Julius to the, to the box. Yeah, that's good. I like it. Uh -huh. So, the cult of the pig. Dan, Mock demands a sacrifice of status. What does the cult offer him? Describe the manner of the offering. So they, they bring in a man from the street that they found who is just filthy and um, they bring him in and they all have to take turns like anointing him with oils and cleaning his feet and like drying his feet with their hair and all of that and just generally like place him in a, in a place of honor above themselves. Good, I love it. A clue, Mr. Nelson. You have gone to this higher spot. It's a little tricky because it's down by the water, but I think you do manage to get up to, um, I think there's like a, so a chain walk is right, is a butts right up next to Cremon Gardens. And there are multi-story flats up there. And I think you have managed to get yourself into a spot um, on a little balcony looking out over to the, um, the, uh, the, the pleasure gardens and you see two things. The first thing you see is a pair of children who are arguing over something. They're saying, no, no, I found it, it's mine. No, 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 we should take it to, no, no, it's, no, give it to me, give it to me. And you will see with your heightened but drained senses that they're arguing over what appears to be a large dorsal fin, seemingly ripped off of a very big fish. They found it somewhere. The second thing you see is related to the nearby uh, farm exhibit set up on Cremorn Gardens. You see green, you know green's there. You see green moving closer to a woman passing out candy to the children and you see that the woman has something under her coat she has under her coat what appears to be i think she has like a rifle you see the end of a rifle under her coat green might be walking into a trap here it's unclear. What do you do? Um, is she, like from my higher vantage point, is she within a range of a revolver? Yes. Uh, then I'm going to have my revolver trained on her and I'm going to wait to see what happens. Green, what do you do when you realize that you've got La Hortensia in your sights? Um, <clears throat> I wonder if green can do something with the jug of ether that he has been carrying around that they've been carrying around maybe <laughs> like a classical uh yeah. movie scene you know yeah, yeah. trying to kind of go get behind her grab her in the dark yeah, yeah grab her and uh, she's, a, she's a very tall make statuous unconscious. Woman, but i think you could probably do it especially with the ether um night move what do you phrase gonna happen if you fail um, I think, um, the kids are going to, that she's, uh, that are kind of swimming around her might get in the way. It's worse than that. Um, it's worse than that. You were going to step into a trap that neither you nor Mr. Nelson were aware of. Let's have the die roll. Let's take a look at your conditions. I think you're marked by La Hortensia. You have to be a disadvantage. She knows you're there, right? 
and it's going to be with uh, probably composure. Yeah, composure. So I'm going to use the jack of uh, ether for a straight roll. Okay. I guess. So uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, that's a six. A six. We will come back to that. You can decide later to do Janice Mask. Mr. Talford, have you had a scene in this little round? Um, I'm not sure. I don't think you did. So do you just intend for Julius to appear? I think so, but I'm going to try to try to like trap him there when he does, right? Because okay. I think this will get him there, but it won't actually trap him there. So I think it's probably a multi-step ritual. I like um, it. Using, I have a letter that's signed in blood. So conveniently, I have his blood, which seems like it would be very <laughs> handy for this sort of situation. He appears. He looks around. He sees you. He says, I take it this is your doing. Consider this your eviction notice. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> what do you do? Um, so I think I've got the, the letter with his blood and I'm just going to start, you know, start chanting. And I think he can feel like when it kicks in, right? That it's like binding him to the house. I like it. I think this is Rites of Salt and Smoke again. Um, and take it away, yeah. All right, and can I use the letter for advantage on this? Absolutely, yeah. Great. Um, that is a seven plus three, so that's a 10. Very good. We will come back to see the final uh, outcome when we're done with the cult of the pig. Adrian, Mock demands a sacrifice of blood. What does the cult offer him? Describe the manner of the offering. Mm, we see the, I think we see, um, kind of the participants in that cult draining blood into like a big, in, into the trough that's there from like their, um, from, from, from their arms. And um, then they bring in a bit, a pig that will feed on it. And blood is kind of everywhere around that feeding frenzy scene. Very good. Hmm. Mr. Nelson, you don't see it in time. Green, I'm taking over the fiction for your miss. Green is circling around La Hortensia. He has something in his hands. She's there feeding the children. She has laid a trap for Green. She anticipated this. She knows he's here. She knows he's going to, or they're going to make a move. She knows they're, what, uh, what's at stake right now? As Green moves into position, he disappears. Someone has snatched them, rather, from the shadows, pulled them, away. Green, you are being tossed 
into a pen filled with angry sows and boars. A part of the farm exhibit that has been closed off from the public this night. They throw you in, the sows and boars, swarm you, their powerful jaws cracking into your shins, dropping you down to the ground, their tusks ripping through your flesh, piercing your rib cage. And Mr. Nelson, you just hear the wild squeals coming up from the rear part of the farm exhibit. Some people are starting to be a little agitated, like, whoa, what's, we didn't even know there were pigs here. And so ends green, unless you're gonna fart the Janus mask right now. I think I'm gonna mark a mask. Um, I think I'm gonna mark the darkened threshold. Oh, very good, what does that do? Let's read it. Hmm. I did. Narrate a scene in which oh. you commit a terrible act of violence in order to help your employer or punish one of their enemies. Oh, very good. Well, you've marked the Janus I wonder, so instead. <laughs> I, I wonder if that, if, if that, how, how close I have to adhere to, to the prompt in, in the sense of help the employer directly or, um, because I, I was kind of envisioning that maybe um, just the Hortensia doesn't go easy and Green actually has to kill I, her. I think that's fine. Yeah, I like that. I think it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Enemy of Hartwood House probably counts. So, yeah, we'll come back to that though. That'll be your final scene. Yeah, Nelson, I'm curious what you do though. Like, okay, so instead, what's happening is you just see Green sort of moving into position. Everything is fine. What are you doing in the meantime, Nelson? Um, I think seeing things go fairly well for green presumably um uh i think he'll make his way down from wherever he is and he'll go to ask those children where they found that fin very good you get your answer straight away it was just tossed in a hedge We will pick back up with Green in a moment before we end the night phase. I do want to check with Mr. Talford. Mr. Talford, describe how you trapped Julius here. Uh, so I think like you can see him like sort of like uh, getting locked into place by these like tendrils of power that are coming out from like from the shadows in the house. Um, and I think he's like, it's almost done when Talifred stops and turns to Mr. Bell and says, um, so I'm not gonna finish until you release any claim to Mr. Nelson. And Mr. Bell, who's there in his beautiful form says, you drive a very hard bargain. But yes, I suppose you can take your itsy bitsy spider. So then, uh, yeah, I think Talifer, you know, nods and he's, he finishes like the last word of the ritual. And uh, you hear Julius scream and just get like yanked into the shadows. Yeah. And, uh, I think Talifred just kind of grabs his coat and walks back out. Good, I like it. Green, give us the conclusion of La Hortensia Fig. What does that look like? Um, so she, what was she wearing again? She was wearing some kind of weapon, like, right? Was it like, a pistol? Yeah she, like... yeah, she had a rifle and, and she has a, rifle, like a cloak yeah. on and a, with a hood. So I, I think um, Green, they actually succeed in kind of coming from the dark and kind of pulling her maybe behind some shed that 
has some of the support material for that farm exhibit. Um, but uh, La Hortensia, because Green, they were unaware that she was carrying a, a weapon, right? So I think um, they, Green's kind of struggling with this tall woman, bring her back. And I think she just grabs the rifle and um, I think trying to point it at Green and I, I think Green with all the force that they have left kind of pushes the rifle or, or back against her and kind of slaps her um, across the, the face and the neck um, and then basically takes it because that's the only weapon he has there and beats her with the, 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 um, uh, the, the rifle. Um, and then she's, she's on the ground and he's kind of sweat, they're sweating and uh, heaving and, uh, and really looking around whether anyone saw this. I think just the pig's dead. That's it. And so concludes the night phase. Let's take a five minute break because you all have some Janus masks to think about. Let's take five, we'll come back to our, to our dawn. I think um, Green also wants to deliver the body to Scotland Yard with like yeah. a little note yeah, I figured. from yeah. that it was Mr. Quinn's work. <laughs> Not very if, good. <laughs> if, uh, I can add one more detail to that. Uh, Hank will help Green move the body from over by the uh, pigs. Yeah. And he'll collect all the straw that is kind of covered in blood and he'll put it in the pig troughs. <laughs> nice. and, and also, I, I, I pushed it up to seven to nine, right? So I'm sure there's something that's uh, going to come up again. From I, just like the, I, yeah, I just like the sort of general gruesomeness of the scene. I think it's fine. Let's take five. It's the dawn phase. No threat was resolved. Let's do dawn questions. Uh, you all did answer a question, so everyone gets credit for that. You have not resolved a threat, however. Mr. Nelson, did you experience an echo in the night? Yes, you did at the end. <laughs> so, so you're getting it in there under the radar or under the, uh, line, under the wire. Uh, did you use violence to solve a problem, Mr. Nelson? I... I demonstrated violence if, if we're considering the shooting game as some kind of violence. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't think so. I don't think it's I don't think right. so. Not, not quite flavored right. Did you stick out in London society for all the wrong reasons? I actually had a thought about that for your, but then you, but then you kind of like moved away from the party. So I don't know if that happened either. Um, unless you think it did. I don't, I don't think it did that. I, I, there was definitely, he was noticed for looking the way he was. I don't and think I don't think it was like, yeah, I, I think the the for all the wrong reasons, it's a hard one for this me. Is the to hard hit. part. Yeah. 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 Uh, let's go to Green. Did you experience an echo in the night, Green? Just with the trough stuff, I guess. Yeah. And, and I also just, I mean, also just the whole like a lot of the stuff that happened in that like last scene was pretty echoey. Did you subtly express sexual desire for your employer in the way you dress them or serve no. them? Did you ensure your employer got credit for your triumph? Yes, by making sure that Mr. Quinn, that Scotland Yard knows Mr. Quinn bagged La Hortensia, very good. Uh, Mr. Talifer, did, did you experience an echo in the night? Uh, the ritual, the burnt money on oh, the- burnt, Oh, that's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, did you perform a ritual? Yes, you did. did all you make, rituals, all day. Oh yeah, did you make love <laughs> to a dark entity because it felt good? I will explicitly be doing that in the flashback because it's required of me. Oh, very good. Um, you can take it now, it's fine. Okay. Um, well, let's talk about that. They play by moves now. Let's do Janice Mask. So who wants to go first? I think we have quite a lot to do here. Uh, I can go. Go for it. So, um, Mine is a flashback to your young adulthood that shows your first sexual encounter with a dark entity. So um, I think we see a, a like young Mr. Talaford um, and it starts off with like a pretty tight in shot of like Talaford and this, and this woman making out and um, it pulls back a little bit and you can see that 
they're making out on top of the altar that we have seen in Mr. Bell's house. And um, he's like, like Talford looks very weirded out, like, like alternately weirded out and horny by this whole situation, but like going along with it. Um, and he's like, you know, are, we, are you sure this is, this is cool? Like that, that we're in here, this, this place just feels wrong. And um, she's like, oh no, no, it's, it's fine. Look, um, but there's just one thing. And um, then it, you can kind of see Mr. Bell like has walked up behind them uh, very much shirtless. And she's like, you know, there's, there's just a friend that I, that I wanted to introduce you to. And I hope you don't mind if he joins us. And um, like Telford just kind of looks back at Mr. Bell and you can see like just shocked by like the unworldly um, like beauty that he sees in Mr. Bell. And he just sort of like mutely nods. Good. Who would like to go next? Uh, I have, I'm ready. Uh, so for Hank, the mask that I just marked was mask of the past, uh, narrate a flashback to the incident that caused you to receive the quickening curse. Big moment. So, huh? yeah. So in the previous one about the flashback of enjoying, um, shows him happy and free in the West, uh, there was a bit of a montage where, which showed him, you know, working in different various careers out there different jobs more than careers um and there's a time where he's working for a uh like a, a, a ranch in this community and they've been having an issue where just cattle have been going missing and they think that like there's been rumors that there's some bandits in the hills that, that there's somebody who's you know hiding out in some cave there uh, and so they gather together four or five of the hands, including Hank, and they they go armed to go and take care of this problem, to go and get, you know, at least, if at the very least, scare off whoever has been stealing their cattle. Um, and they make their way up towards this cave, and there's, like, signs of, like, you know, bones from cattle that have just been sort of strewn about there. And they're like, okay, well, we must be in the right spot. Only the way that they've been sort of feasted on and then discarded seems more animal than human um and as you know one of the hands mentions that as we go into the into the cave uh a like bit of web catches around their leg and then they just get pulled down into the darkness in this cave um and as their screams you know you hear echoing down uh the the party of four remaining chases after them and what ensues uh, as we like break into a chamber is there's just like carcasses of animals and some humans just like suspended up in this chamber uh, in this webbing. And there's this gigantic yellow and gray spider um, that has already begun like biting on the leg of the one that it just drew in. And it's a wild fight occurs in here uh there's gunfire which isn't seem to have any sort of great effect on this creature uh one after another the different hands begin to fall um and there's only uh hank and the the one who was dragged in who who sort of had they'd started eating but had been interrupted um who are like still conscious and fighting this thing and right as it sort of steps into and and kills the other man there on the ground uh hank with all the strength he has left he can muster just like grabs a big rock from in here and just brings it down as hard as he can on the 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 back of this thing and it like wails and it turns around and like bites his shoulder and he just from there in its weakened state he just like pummels it until he he breaks through and he limps out of the cave the only survivor Awesome, thank you. Green, do you have one? Yes, <clears throat> um, uh, I already did the mask uh, of the future, um, violence, but I also marked um, mask of the past, narrative flashback to, to the event that eventually forced you into servitude. Another um, So I think, um, 
at the beginning of the flashback, uh, Green is, um, they are really on kind of on top of the world in Paris, uh, in this um, fashion scene, right? So for the last couple of years, they have been really successful um, as a designer and, you know, all the um, all the women that are important this season are wearing uh, these kind of designs and dresses. Um, and of course, it's very extravagant, like Paris, you know, uh, seems to be. And I think uh, Green has this sudden, over, over a couple of months, they get this idea that now this is time that, that this, this kind of career and all these designs have to spread beyond Paris and beyond France. So we see Green frantically kind of tailoring and making one dress after the other and packing them up in big boxes and all of this, and then uh, taking all of it uh, to London um, to kind of set up a store there um, with this extravagant French fashion. Um, and this will conquer London by storm. Um, by, and I think the first thing that we see then is kind of green waiting one morning in the store. And it has been a couple of weeks, I think, that the store has opened uh, and it's still all shiny and so on. And a woman comes in and kind of with a very angry look on her face and she throws a dress at green and kind of says like, how could you you know, convince me to wear this, um, this, this thing at people were laughing at me and, and it's green. They hold up the dress and it's very risk, risque kind of, uh, you know, might fit in uh, France and in a kind of Paris environment, but apparently among like the um, elite uh, of uh, London that was considered to be completely inappropriate. And um, the woman says, I will tell all my friends to never shop here. And then over the next couple of uh, weeks, we see like customers dwindling, no one coming in. It's always just green alone there. And um, at a certain moment, it's kind of, we see where they finally closed the, sh uh, the shop and um, they invested all of the money they had into in this. And apparently London was not ready for it. So sad. <laughs> Good. I think that's everything in the dawn phase. Any other Janus masks? Uh, um, we shall have stars, stars and wishes. I'll start with stars. I really like that we got here at the end. I really love that we got like, for all three characters who are here right now, we got like the pivotal moment, like for them, right? Like the big, like, well, there's a second one for Mr. Talliford as well, but like, we got the kind of big like hinge moment of like why you're here doing this, you know, which I think is really intriguing. Um, so that was really great, uh, but that's just a start, but I, I might have more later, but anyway, anybody else wants to go now? So I really liked the entire unseen tonight. Yeah, um, yeah, it was cool. very evocative, like all of the, all of the scenes in it were great. Yeah, I liked it too. And I liked that we got to see like a little bit of like Obert's world, even though Obert's dead, you know, it was kind of fun. Uh, I I really liked finally getting to use the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> yeah, that was a great scene. It was a terrific scene. And that actually goes to another star I have for the whole session. Uh, with the exception of like just sort of gruesome end, the, the session was very light and had a very like light celebratory feel in a way, or like a, the revelry feel I think was really like pronounced and... Um, uh, I quite enjoyed that as a change of pace. I thought it was nice. Yeah, the star star to the, to the system just for the 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 width I think of of tone that the game supports, um, and like it it always sort of pulls you back to some of those darker places. It's designed to do that, um, but I think the it supports a spectrum and. It, it does so, I think, in a really good way. It's just really, it was really fun. I think to kind of follow or connect it to this, 
uh, a star for the dice somehow because for me it was that I had mostly misses today and then one 11, uh, which I think was an interesting. So I like that scene in a certain sense because somehow uh, that's the moment where Green kept their calm when the there was the gas leak somehow. And um, but that it, that was kind of the up and uh, up point, and everything else was kind of really harsh. Um, so the dice uh, really structured like everything that I had planned or that that I so. Um, in this session. I'll do a star for, um, I I really liked how we were doing like echoes in the day too, today. Uh, there were lots of like, lots of stuff with little kids, lots of stuff with animals, lots of stuff with birds. That was, there was a weirdly bird heavy session. Um, I just kind of enjoyed all that. I thought that was really great. Uh, like we were just getting like interesting thematic connections without even really like intentionally doing it. You know, I thought that was, that was fun. Uh, it's it's a wish, but I I would love uh, for Hank to be at whatever event the gardens have been reserved for. Um, yeah, what is that event? I don't know. I don't know, yeah, but knows? I'm intrigued. I've given myself a, a vague amount of wiggle room in terms of when we're going to do that. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Any other stars or wishes? So we didn't even see it that much today, but I, I really like the Waitley camera threat. Like it just feels very different than most of them. And like, it has the weird, like mystical, like sort of sci-fi even. It, it does like. have a sci-fi vibe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well and I, I actually uh, kind of a star and a wish combined for me. I, I'm glad everybody was cool with like holding their, you know, keeping their powder dry on the Waitley camera until you're all here because it's kind of like a big deal. Like the, the how you resolve that thread is a really, really big deal thing. And so I, I didn't want to like have Alicia not here for that, you know? Uh, but my wish of course is I'll be very excited to see that happen. So, because you all have the opportunity to literally travel to the fragrant void, right? <laughs> and so, yeah, that could be fun. I think uh, now that the Hortensia is apparently not coming back to read to the children again, I'm wondering whether that's now Green's job. <laughs> I think that would be a really interesting thing to do. Yeah, yeah. Could be. I actually, that's actually kind of a star and a wish for me as well, because I really, I really like the brothel thing. Like that's not something that's in the threat. That's something that just kind of came up in the role play. Um, but I really like that. I really like Green's sort of like situating in that, you know, and like sort of it being almost like, you know, a, a big part of the factotum is like their private life, right? Like their life away from Hargrave House is a big theme with them. And so we're getting to really see that, which I think is super cool. Um, stars, I'll, I'll throw a star as well out. Uh, I just, I really enjoyed the kind of, um, uh, Alicia's not here, but a star for like Mr. Quinn's sort of, um, that scene with the Society of Obscura. I just think the Society of Obscura is such a fascinating like group. And because everybody loves like, I mean, who doesn't love like, rich weirdos right like that's always fun and um and i thought and i thought mr quinn was very very just the way they dominate the scene i think it's really really fun i enjoyed that um yeah any other stars or wishes uh a couple of uh wishes uh well one is i ha i came up with a few things so i thought i might be leading into a tall tales but then the, the narrative didn't support it so i didn't go for one but i i'd love to get some tall tales action with hank uh and the other the other thing is uh i think the next time uh i fail on the quickening i think i'm just gonna go for, go for the, the curse. curse yeah i thought so too i was um, thinking of that with the break i was like i wonder if david's gonna just lean into the cursed at this point I, basically um, it's whichever happens first either i'm gonna run out of masks which yeah. i only have i only have You're two close. left that don't yeah. kill me yeah so uh either i'm gonna run out of masks or i'm gonna suffer the quickening and i don't know curse. which yeah so. that would be interesting to see how it goes um yeah very intriguing that's how it goes huh. um i i want to note here it's not a star or a wish but i will note that we did 
uh, we have been fulfilling Adrian's wish from last time, which was to mark more personal quarters items. So uh, congratulations on everybody uh, marking PQs. <laughs> so that was good. It's actually, it's such a, it's like, I, I, if I were, I've never played, I've literally never played my own game, but I, if I, if I did, I, I would be leaning into personal quarters a lot because it's like, it's a huge mechanical benefit. And, um, and one of the advancements is to unmark it all. <laughs> so I would be getting it all marked, you know, that's just me. Um, it's a role-playing challenge, I guess, but because some of the stuff is very, very tricky to like figure out how do we make this work in the scene, but you know, that's the fun of it, so. But also it's, it's, of it's fun to fail one. sometimes. Oh, that's true. Sure. Oh, that's, a, that's a very good point, actually, Dan. I, that's a fair point. Like it is frequently fun to just fail too, so. Um, I, I was kind of curious when you all did the, uh, when we had that, issue with the with the theory or the answer a question like whether you all are going to mark Janus mask or not to bump it up essentially what was going to happen is like i was going to basically have la hortensia like like lead an assault on it was going to be like an assault on hargrave house like you all were going to have to deal with la hortensia and her shenanigans like at hargrave house i thought that could have been really fun but you know that's how it goes sometimes but, uh anything else before we go Okay, well, in that case, I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>